You've reached BoobTube Boys, a television show podcast that always begins with classy sounding piano music. I'm Brian Vaughn. With me are Spencer Hendricks. That's me. And Van Lee. I am here. How are you guys? Well, I'm about to sleep after hearing the yeah. intro to Rock I actually Body didn't Loves know. I, after mm-hmm. watching these two, I did not know that was the intro music. It reminds me a little bit of Frasier, actually. Mm-hmm. I Got was a little just bit getting that. ready to say that, Spencer, that the Everybody Loves Raymond intro music there does not fit the show and feels more frasier I'm expecting Kelsey Grammer to burst in at any moment with, I guess, some kind of rendition about Raymond. Did Kelsey Grammer ever guest on this show? Because I could see I, it. I could see it, Niles, too. Niles, I... I don't approve of Raymond's article in Newsweek. Oh, he would never read it. It's sports. I was going to say, he probably, oh, true. He probably be... would think he was too good for this show. He's got to stay in high-cultured shows like Frasier. But that's the whole Cheers. thing is the the high highbrow lowbrow mix, you know. Mm. You can, or I guess in everybody loves Raymond's case, like lower middle brow. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. It's kind of confusing. We're talking about a sitcom again. We've been doing that with some regularity lately. One thing I've enjoyed is seeing the differences between them. They all kind of take different approaches to the same problems. Unlike the Brady Bunch, which we just covered. Everybody Loves Raymond did, in fact, run for forever. (laughs) Nine years and 210 episodes, which is nuts. You guys want to guess how it started? Mm. Ray Romano was a stand-up comedian. I know that. It's it's like how every show in the 80s and 90s started, isn't it? Roseanne, The Cosby Show, Seinfeld. Others I can't think of on the spot. (laughs) (laughs) Mad About You. Yeah. All Riser. Ellen. Move back when she had a sitcom that we did watch as a fan. I watched it as a kid. Yeah. I thought it was pretty funny as a kid. I don't remember anything about it. I know Laura Dern outed Ellen on the show, like her character did. That, that was, was Laura that Dern. That was when it happened. Yeah. You and that's think why I they had Laura that. Dern do it because, of course, she is famously gay. And so then it, anyway, it was a whole Laura thing. Dern is also famously a big part of my life ever since Jurassic Park. She just always will be. Before getting a TV show, Ray Romano, as I mentioned, was a stand-up comedian. Well, he did a set on David Letterman that a lot of people liked, apparently, and CBS got in touch with him and said, hey, man, we want to make a sitcom with you, because that's if you're a comedian, that's what the next step is. You get five minutes on a late-night show, and then you get a sitcom. And then eight years later, you've got 200 episodes under your belt, yeah. and you will make crazy money off syndication for mm-hmm. the rest of your life. And you don't really have to do anything else if you don't want to. You could just sound like this. <laughs> and that's it. That's all you need to do to be famous. That's the main thing. A certain Kermitness. What do you <laughs> think his stand up would be? Just, probably just exactly what the show is. Like, I'm kind of mean. Of, lots of married humor. Yeah. I believe it was very and continued to be after when he did do stand up, continued to be very family friendly, family centric. He liked to think of himself as like a weird family friendly comedian, hmm. which is not entirely inaccurate. But we'll we'll get to that. When I think of weird family friendly comedian, it's Jim Gaffigan to me. Yeah, like or uh, what's there. the guy Brian Regan? I think I do not like him. I don't. Like him, I'm not a big boys. fan either. But I think he falls into that category yeah. of like he's a more successful, not successful obviously, but like at just the stand up part, he's yeah. probably better known for that well, sort of thing. I think he actually is somewhat funny, but it's the gimmicky stuff. I cannot yeah. do gimmicky stand up comedians. Yeah. Bobcat Goldthwait is a famous one. Uh, what's his name? Who's now loathed by everyone? The skinny nerd who did the "What's Up, Pussycat" joke at the Waffle House. Tom Jones? No, the, not the <laughs> singer, the comedian. Who the whole the song bit. was a, a joke at the. Uh, who did this? He's now married to Olivia Munn, and everyone hates him. Oh, John Mulaney. John Mulaney. Yeah, I didn't when know he about this. Did stand up initially? He would always do this thing where he had like this sad old lady bit voice where you go and you don't know what you're doing oh yeah yeah Ooh, i hate it and i think he was funny i don't know yeah. now because he's an asshole but i thought he was funny but i couldn't handle stand up with him because of that yeah it was a delivery issue for you <laughs> which it, uh, we've talked about john mulaney i also do not like the delivery lots of good jokes in there again i don't really know what he's been doing i'll hopefully. tell you a good version of john mulaney nathan fielder from nathan oh, yeah. for you and he's got the new show on hbo same kind of like nerdy personality, like sad boy, but oh, it's so good. Any, I am anything with him in it, go watch it. Almost entirely unfamiliar with the Nathan Fielder stuff, and we'll have to cover it at some point because I, it actually was a thing where I think last summer he got so much like positive publicity from even 
like everything I respect, like all the sources I would respect, that it put me off. <laughs> oh, nice. One of those things where I was like, I can't watch. Like, it's too universally praised, and I don't really want to watch the zeitgeist thing right now or whatever. Yeah, But I now, time has passed, and now I'm primed for it. <laughs> you should. It's funny. I'm very curious to see what it even is, because I understand there's an interesting conceit, and it has not been spoiled for me. So, Good. yeah, that'll be cool. This isn't really about Nathan for you. It's about everybody loves Raymond. Do you notice how when we cover shows that inevitably I'm going to loathe, I often talk about other things at length so I don't have to talk about the yeah. show? I don't know if that's intentional or not. I don't think <laughs> it's intentional, but it just happens. You know, we have to go where the wind takes us <laughs> or where Ray Romano takes us. <laughs> when Everybody Loves Raymond was getting developed also, this is kind of different than some of the shows we've discussed. There was no showrunner with an idea for what the show was. Mm. CBS and Ray Romano were teamed up looking for a showrunner. And they found Philip Rosenthal, who wound up doing it, and wound up having the main idea for the show. And his primary credit before this was being a writer at Coach, oh. which is a show we have definitely covered. What do you think is the primary premise of Everybody Loves Raymond? So, what would you okay. boil it down to? I will tell you this. So... It started out, Ray Romano, who's from Queens, wanted to make a show about a male stand-up comedian in his 30s who joked around with his buddies and went to a diner a lot. And I guess Philip Rosenthal was the one who was like, you can't do that. And here's the thing about there that. There is a really legendarily good one of those called Seinfeld, and you aren't that. <laughs> and he actually urged Romano to lean into the family stuff. He said, that's more what your material is. It's also your life. Ray Romano had twins in real life, young twins at the time, uh, and I guess was struggling to juggle traveling for stand-up and that. And so Rosenthal was like, let's lean into that. And then that grouping of people had the idea of, we want the show, though, to be more about adult relationships. So that's the, I think the main conceit is adult children and parents. Yeah, that and, makes sense. And, you know, the lifelong, built-in, under-the-skin <laughs> A dirt and grime that is there just waiting to burst out at every moment, but repackaged so you can watch it with your 10-year-old or whatever, I think. As for Ray's family, they decided to go ahead and do a mixture of Romano and Rosenthal's real-life family. So Marie and Deborah are based on Rosenthal's mother and wife in this case, whereas Robert is based on Ray Romano's real brother. Apparently, Ray Romano won some sort of award and his brother called and was like, they're winning awards, and I got shot at today at work. Oh, so he's a cop. He was an, yeah, oh, okay. so that is a real thing. Huh. And when trying to cast Robert, I guess they wanted like a little little guy, like a little scrappy guy. They messed that up. And they got the exact opposite of that. And so <laughs> they, they did. They were like, instead, like, let's get a giant sheepish guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's described as a gentle giant, I guess. Yeah. I, I don't know. I didn't Which get he is, any you know? vibe from it, so whatever. Yeah, sure. Oh, yeah. Ray Romano wasn't really an actor either. Huh. Uh, yeah, like all of these stand-up shows we've talked about, they needed to kind of fill the cast out with veteran actors. That's what happened here. Let's go ahead and just talk about Brad Garrett first. He is Ray's gigantic, jealous brother. He's six foot nine in real life. He's a character actor who's appeared all over the place. And at, at the time he got the role as Robert Barone, he had already been in Seinfeld, of course, as a deranged mechanic. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Tony, right? Yeah. Was this his big first role? Yeah, this okay. would be like his breakout. Now I'm a, a name in sitcoms. Before that, it was a lot of guest starring. Because, of course, he has the sitcom after this. What's it called? Like, just, I Hug My Wife. Just Shoot Me. Till wasn't Death. He, wasn't he in Just Till Shoot Death. Me? I don't think you he was You guys remember that's David with David Spade, Spade yeah. And, uh, <laughs> David Spade and Brad Garrett. I always get those two guys confused. <laughs> Who was it that was in Tommy Boy with Chris Farley? Was that Brad Garrett? Yeah, it was him. Mm-hmm. Patricia Heaton, who plays Raymond's annoyed wife, she also had been kind of in episodes of sitcoms, but this, but Raymond was like the big role for her. It's the one that allowed her to be in that news show with Kelsey Grammer, where they uh, like bicker at the news desk and and probably fall in love. I don't know. It was on in like the 2010s, maybe. You say this is her big role. I believe her big role was, of course, as one of the antagonists in Beethoven. The 90s movie with the big dog and Charles Yeah, Burden. I'll counter you with how she played woman fan in Space Jam. Okay, pretty good, too. Two big 90s roles. <laughs> See, she's been in films. <laughs> but you know who really has been in a lot of movies? 
Peter Boyle. Peter Boyle. He's been in a ton of movies. He was in Taxi Driver as a creep. Young Frankenstein, Monsters Ball as another creep. Plays a creep and everybody loves Raymond. Yep. He's an overbearing asshole dad named Frank Barone. We have Doris Roberts also in plenty of movies and a regular in Remington Steel Ooh. with Pierce Brosnan. Mm, yeah. I almost picked that show. She also did appear in an episode of Walker, Texas Ranger. Good for her. As someone named Elaine Portugal in <laughs> season three's The Big Bingo Bamboozle. So I did a little... Little research. It has to be a CD centric episode. That's my guess. It is. You say it okay, it yeah. is CD centric, and it seems more like a real crime was committed. No supernatural stuff. Uh, well, season three, they didn't Early quite on. get into that as much. Yeah, yeah. Huh. But everybody's been on Walker, and I decided I'd better know what she did. Elaine Portugal. You'll get Doris Roberts. You think that's what she should be named? <laughs> <laughs> there are kids too. They're barely in the show ever, and they're Good. they're kind of a tossed off thing. They're all siblings in real life, and their names are Sawyer and Sullivan Sweeten and Madeline Sweeten. That's all real. And none of them are related to Jody Sweeten. That was my question. From Full House. Okay. Too bad. Too bad for them. Yeah. But again, (laughs) they're not really important so much as plot devices, which I remember even thinking as a kid, I I preferred that in a family sitcom to not have to deal with like kid plots. Mm -hmm. Not that they're making necessarily the best use of other kinds of plots, but still, right? You know? Before we talk about our episode, which is season three, episode 16, Frank's Tribute from 1999. Raymond Ramon says, I just whooped your ass. Oh, <laughs> 316. <laughs> what? <a>, okay. <laughs> what if Ray Romano was a wrestler? Not a good one. No. <laughs> what's, uh, what's the gimmick there? It'd have to be just like Jersey guy. Like It'd have to be Jersey like, yeah. here's my tag team partner, Brad Garrett. He's going to do all the work. Oh, they yeah. could do a little guy, big guy tag team. Yeah, actually, the Barone brothers. So that's an appropriate time for me to say, for Brad Garrett to be 6'9", I expected Ray Romano to be much shorter next to him than he is. 6'2". I yeah. was going to say, like that means Ray Romano is not a little guy. No. Because I was, that was why I decided Brad Garrett couldn't actually be 6'8", because when they stand together... It's not that ridiculous, and it should be. Brad Garrett is ridiculous. But I will present that in this episode, when they're around all the naked men, those (laughs) guys are so little, and they're old. Yeah. But that's what made me look it up, because I'm like, wait, why are these old men so little? It's not that. It's just the two main (laughs) actors are big. Yeah, they were standing next to two really quite large guys. I remember an episode of this that I watched when I was a kid, where the storyline is Ray is no longer six feet tall. He has shrunk just under it, and it's like a big middle-aged crisis for him. Mm. That happens in the show? Yeah. What's funny, though, is he's taller than that. Yeah. <laughs> he's six taller. two. Hopefully he didn't lose three inches in real life. No, but what he was lying about it, he'd be 5'11 and lie that he was six foot. I don't know who would do that. <laughs> oh, yeah, but what I was going to tell you guys is, before we get into the episode, I found out there are actually international versions of Everybody Loves Raymond that have been adapted. And I wanted to tell you the names of some of these. Russia has Veronin's family. Veronin? Yeah. So Baron, but they- may, I okay, think so. Maybe. I think that's the idea. Poland has Everybody Loves Roman. <laughs> <laughs> Holland has Everybody is Crazy About Jack. <laughs> that's my favorite they one. They just that, completely changed everything. That one and the next one might be my favorite. India has Sumit will handle everything. <laughs> <laughs> So these hey, are, I got a problem. What should I do? Ah, Sumit will handle it. Yeah, just get hold of Sumit. He's got it. Do you think Sumit's like, yeah, like he still talks like that? He talks like Ray. Yeah. Ramon, yeah. I really like the everybody's crazy about Jack thing. Isn't that the, <laughs> isn't that the party pack party game that you guys yeah. play every week? Everybody's Jackbox. crazy about Jack. Everybody's crazy about Jack. Also, I just imagine all these people hovering around their windmill and their wooden shoes <laughs> to play, to watch an episode of everybody is crazy about Jack. <laughs> What are you doing, Cinderhar? <laughs> well, Samit, here's what's happening with our dad. <laughs> I hate both of you. That's the dad in this scenario. Sumit and Brad Garrett's dad. <laughs> well, I guess we've dawdled long enough. Let's actually get into the episode, right? Mm, yeah. I guess we have to. Hell of an episode. Hell of an episode. We'll see uh, where we all stand on it. The episode starts out in Marie and Frank's kitchen, in case you guys wondered which of the Barone kitchens we were in. I did. Now, explain something to me. Where do they all live in conjunction with one another? So the families live in Long Island, and the other part of the show's premise that I should have mentioned earlier is they live across from one another. Ray's parents, Frank and Marie, moved in across the street. Okay. 
that's kind of the issue is they're so close they can't escape one another. Yeah, they make a little snide remark at the end of this episode, I believe, about how they wish they weren't so close. And yeah. it gets such Although, a glorious laughter from the crowd. It's it's funny, that's why. <laughs> well, and, and I'll explain why the joke is supposed to be funny. Oh, is it because... I probably get you, it. I'm sure you do. But. Is it because of like the thought process that I didn't realize the parents were the ones that are oh, the reason why? Turning yeah. it on its head. So fast right. forward to the end of the episode, that's the joke that ends it. Right. I see, I didn't get it. I see now why it was so it's, fucking yeah, it's funny. It's ironic. I, the parents don't want to be near the kids because they just boned. My first thought when you said that the parents moved in was, well, why did they have the gall to complain about it at the end? And now I get supposed to, it's a joke. I get it. And this kitchen is hideous too, by the way. Yeah. But in a different way from like what we saw with the Brady Bunch, this kitchen is hideous in a 90s, 2000s, like grandma. Exactly. It's, it's really well appointed what for what was, they're going for, I think. What was the air date of this episode? Do you have 1999, that? and all okay. the stuff looks almost late 70s, mm -hmm. or a lot it of it. looks older than 99. So it fits that mold, though, but it, yes, it does. Yeah. I noticed it had like a huge, I don't even know what to call it. It's almost like a little divider between where they are and there is an the, open the wall room. area mm -hmm. that, yeah, you could almost. You can't walk all the way through it, but you can see through all of it. I, I don't know the architectural term for it, but it was, it's very dated and it was a, I guess probably a cool thing back then, but looked really weird now. What do you do with a big window in your well, house? Well, you just kind of lean on it and stare at the yeah. person on the other side. Or it's, put a see what up by it's almost like the half measure of the big open floor plan thing they have done in recent years mm -hmm. before they wanted to actually open the house. So they just kind of put a wall there that you can look through. Who does that open, <laughs> open I don't know. shit? I No, I like corners and tight spaces so I can see what's happening around me. Yeah, the open floor plan is definitely for, I guess, happy families with small children where moms want to cook their dinners and watch their kids do their homework at the same time. Perhaps. Yeah, I think they had an open floor plan on Father Knows Best. It wouldn't work for anyone else. Like That would be a terrible arrangement if you just had like roommates. You don't want to <laughs> see everyone all the time, everything you do. That actually reminds me of another good use of an open floor plan Father Knows Best does, which is you could make your own ice cream in the center of the room. <laughs> just yeah. roll that thing right back and forth between each yeah, other. Yeah, why not? Watch Daddy crank it all day. <laughs> oh, oh boy. <laughs> you know that? That ties back into what we're talking about with Everybody Loves Raymond, It actually. sure does. Lots of cranking going on in yeah, there. A little bit. Raymond walks into his parents' kitchen, and he says, ah, what's Dad done now? And what's weird about this for me is that there's no context for that. It's the first thing anyone says. Like, why are we to believe that Frank, his father, has done something? Well, he has. He's one man of the year at his lodge. Oh, boy. What an honor. And this is one of those lodges that old men go to. Oh, yeah. We soon learn what kind of lodge it is. <laughs> I was not sure what to expect from the dad. I only knew a little bit. And this is season three, so I don't know how established he was as being how he is at this point Yeah, in the show. this is what he is. So I wasn't sure what any of this meant or why it was supposed to be noteworthy that he won Man of the Year. He won Man of the Year, which everyone finds strange because he's a curmudgeon. He's an asshole. Isn't he? That, yeah. yeah. I'd lean more asshole than curmudgeon. Curmudgeon leaves the possibility that it's like, I would oh, it's say, cute. Yeah. I would say irredeemable fuckface. Correct. <laughs> that's fair, too. That's that's definitely fair. That's actually, I think, one of the archetypes they were that if you look <laughs> in like the rules of fiction or whatever. Mm -hmm. That's one of them. <laughs> oh, here you got the irredeemable fuckface. We'll put him in here and it'll oh, be look, funny for a whole scene. Look, it's Peter Boyle's face. He's been, He's done this a lot in his career. Ray jokes right away that Time Magazine has gone downhill. I thought that was an okay joke. <laughs> not and bad. delivered okay. No, not bad. And we could say it now and it still applies. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and Marie says, I hate that lodge. You can't even go there if you're a woman unless you're planning a party for them. So that, again, gives you an idea of Frank, his lodge, how much he cares about Marie. I bet it's like one of those, what is it, the Shriners? Yeah. And uh, Elks Club. I bet it's something That's like that. That's what I was picturing, too. We have, so for listeners in Missouri, we have Shriners and Elks Club. I don't really know what they all are, mm -mm. but it seems like men go there. Secret society. Yeah, and like they <laughs> shake hands and have cigars and stuff. And in the case of the Shriners, you have one of those Fez hats on. Fez. Well, that's awesome, though. Yeah. Huh? That would be the whole reason I would join. So Do you think you could pull a Fez off as a fashion accessory? Sure don't. Answer. <laughs> no. No? No. Nobody? I think if you did that, again, none of us have confidence, but if you did it <laughs> with confidence, people would accept it. Guys, this is an inside story. It'll all make sense to the listeners when we get to the end of the journey. But we watched 
part of an episode of some Christian drama show that's out now. We couldn't even finish it. It was so boring. Yeah, we wanted to actually cover it on the podcast, mm -hmm. potentially. It is bad. Couldn't get through an episode. But the, there was a, a character actor who was famous who showed up in that. Yes. And he's bald. He has the beard, kind of like Spencer's, a little pepper and salty. I think if you were a Fez, it would remind me of him, which would then make me think that you made it. Okay, so if Spencer were a Fez. Trying to, trying to play a Jewish man. Then you would believe you know, him to be Jews and their to be a successful character actor. Correct. Okay, Spencer, I think you should do it. Just think about. I would have to be a character actor for sure. Like I'm, we're not, we're not leading man material. On no, long tube two boys. I already know what I would be. I would absolutely have to lean into my voice, and I would have to be like a goofy little dumb best friend. Didn't everyone say you were that guy on How I Met Your Mother or whatever? Was that the yeah, show? Yeah, but that was also when I was a lot younger and, <laughs> shall we say, smaller, and uh, had my teeth were better. <laughs> I also have a quick question about. Everyone loves Raymond real quickly, which is mm -hmm. another you know person who I've been this... told I look like. Sure. Whatever. <laughs> you, you know how he's part of this big club or whatever. Are they a Frank? family? Yeah. Are they a family of means? No. Okay. So Frank's retired from some sort of, uh, you know, blue collar work. Makes sense. That he did. Ray, of course, is a sports writer. Robert's a cop. So they're, they're pretty working class, but they do fine. That's why I mentioned to you guys earlier that I think they're sort of. I guess lower middle class, somewhere in that range. Maybe just, middle middle class. I wasn't sure if this was like a, because you barely see the lodge in this episode. I wasn't sure if it was supposed to be snobby or not, or if he was like a pretentious type or what. But yeah, it makes sense that he was blue collar. And the set design definitely fits that too. Yeah. Yeah, it does. Upon finding this whole thing out about Man of the Year that Raymond hates, that Marie hates, Robert likes it. And Robert, of course, is Brad Garrett, Ray's brother. And he's at this point seated at the kitchen table so that we don't know that he's as tall as the ceiling. That's what I yet. was thinking is with a cast member like that, if you're the director of photography, you have to frame scenes differently than any yeah. other show. You would because, I mean, almost no actors are that height. Yeah, there, there's only like one, James Cromwell, and that's Yeah, that's and Brad it. Garrett. Yeah, you got to put them together if you want not someone to slouch. This isn't just because of age. I know they're both similar in height, but Brad Garrett could fucking take James Cromwell out. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, James Cromwell was never the physical presence Brad Garrett He is. was never a James Bombwell. It, James Cromwell looks like he, in his peak years even, when he was a young man and he was as strong as he ever was, weighed 130 pounds. Yeah, 6'7", <laughs> seven, 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 135. Yeah. You say he's not intimidating, but you haven't seen that episode of Renegade where he is a professor at a school and he kidnaps Bobby Six Killer oh, because shit. he's a serial killer and chains him in his basement. And I'm joking, but oh. that's a, no, that's a real episode, I mean. But not James Cromwell. No, it was James Cromwell. He was so good in it. Like, I was frightened of James him Cromwell was in Renegade? Renegade, yes. Wow. With well, Reno we Reigns we gotta that. find yeah. a reason to watch that at some point. I yeah. don't know why he did that. That's amazing. It was so good. Ugh. It was like a Silence of the Lambs thing. That's it's, I can't believe this crazy. is real. That is fantastic. <laughs> I'm still not sure if it is. Are you sure? <laughs> oh, it's, I'm real. I okay. would by now I would have caved. Yeah, and yeah. <laughs> Usually, so Ray doesn't want to go to this thing, and he starts uh, right away making excuses to get out of it. I got dibs on. I'm sick that night. <laughs> you do some cop overtime at work. Monkey on a bus somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> So this is Ray suggesting what he and Robert might use as excuses. Mm, monkey on a bus. Somewhere. Monkey on a bus somewhere, yeah. Just kind of tossed off. And this I wanted to include to bring up something about Ray Romano. Often in this show, especially early on, I enjoy something about his casual, just tossed off delivery. Almost like he's behind where he should be saying his sentence, like he doesn't even know he's there. I like that. And yet what he says mm -hmm. is almost never funny to me. Well, in two ways, it's like he doesn't know what a punchline is because A, he doesn't tell a good joke, but B, because he doesn't talk like someone who's telling a joke with a punchline would speak. Yeah. Later on, after Everybody Loves Raymond and everything, he was a regular on a show I watched called Parenthood, and he was also a uh, main cast member on a series with Andre Bauer and Scott Bakula called Men of a Certain Age. And he was very good in both of those as just kind of a weird middle-aged guy. Hmm. And I think it's another one of those cases, perhaps, 
where Ray Romano was better at having some sort of on-screen presence and eventually being a character actor than maybe being funny. <laughs> or being the star. Yeah. I'm skipping ahead, but yeah. everyone on the show is better than Ray Romano. Everybody, Everybody loves everyone. him. Somehow. And that is what they were going for, you know, surround him with good actors, but you are totally right. Robert doesn't care about these excuses Ray's giving, though. He's proud of his dad, I mean, for some reason. And it's at this point that I stopped paying attention to what anyone was saying and started paying attention to how there were giant spoons and forks on the wall. Oh, like, I saw that. Yeah, and it reminded me of The Room, Tommy Wiseau's uh, the spoons, yeah. classic. Who knows why I'm mentioning that right no, now? No, it is actually really hard not to notice giant silverware. I have, I have a hard time with it myself. One time I was doing like a... It was a partly a job interview, but where you shadow and you go actually work with the person of job that you'll be having. And they had a giant spoon hanging in their cubicle. And I had to stop them while they were telling me about their job and be like, tell me the story about that spoon. I can't concentrate until you tell mm -mm. me. No, I need to know. And can we use it? Is there any way we can eat something with <laughs> was that? Was there a good story to it? No. It mm. was really boring. And I didn't get the job. Well, I didn't want the job. So it, it all ended badly, really. Or correctly since you didn't want it. I didn't job. want it. Yeah, that's true. There's I also I, I wanted the spoon. A <laughs> giant butter thing. You know how it's a long rectangular piece of china that you put your butter on. Oh yeah, on? that's oh, yeah. Fancy. it's on the table. I don't know if there's butter in it, but it's there. Probably that is a very late 90s grandmother thing to own. A, I like my a butter chill. butter dish. I don't want it out in the in the room temperature settings. Well, unless you're doing certain baking dishes sure. where you want Sometimes soft butter. Sometimes it's good to have soft butter. If you leave a big glob of butter out like that, that's going to get snatched up by a Brad Garrett just like that. <laughs> There's <laughs> nothing you can even butter? do about it. That's, that's his diet. Is <laughs> if just it's out. the stick right in his face. If that... <laughs> There's a scene where he comes out walking from the fridge just eating a stick of butter. <laughs> I can't help it, Raymond. <laughs> I keep growing. <laughs> so Marie tells Robert and Ray, you guys have to go. I am not doing this. I'm not dealing with the lodge. I like that. I like because having known her character from watching the show as a kid, she often acquiesces. Well, and in this episode, she will, too. But I liked her shutting one thing down. Robert's now very excited. He knows officially he gets to help make a tribute to his father. And his idea is to go ahead and sing a song from the musical South Pacific that I watched in my middle school music class. What's it about? I don't know. Sailors in Hawaii, I think. Mm. So it's not like that one sailor movie where I guess it's pirates. But they do, I am the very model of a modern major general. That's all I know. Oh, I like that, though. I like that. Pirates of Penzance. Did. There you go. Ah. No, no, it's not like that. It's not like that at all. I'm Apparently, it involves grass skirts and coconut bras, and Brad Garrett wants to put them on. This is another case where I think the writing is not much of anything at all, but I like Brad Garrett's enthusiasm. Brad Garrett has a lot of enthusiasm. He is not uh, half-assing it. It's right now that the man of the year walks in and demands the chair of the year. It's Frank. The family, dad, and grandpa. And what's he wearing? Not enough. It's boxer shorts with a tight white shirt tucked into them. He's really showing off all his ripples and <laughs> and kind of uh, segments. Does that thing that people of his age will do where the boxers are just all the way up. And all the way <laughs> like up. Belly I mean, button. Most of the way up his stomach. It's the kind of thing you can do and as a person with testicles still camel toe yourself. <laughs> It's, he shouldn't be doing it, probably. He's being really smug at this point, Frank is, despite being himself about how he's one man of the year. He decides to do a little bit of king shit talk. I still put my pants on one leg at a time. <laughs> yeah, when can we look forward to that? I like that you had the musical sting in there, man. That's good. <laughs> You're going to find out with each of the clips that I pulled for you, I left the entirety of the laugh track, which I'm going to be saying the words laugh track a lot, because every joke, no matter what it is. It is a studio audience. Is it? Yeah. I think they're either given something at they, the door. Uh, they could be beefing it up. Because no joke, it'll be like, hey, get Brad Garrett, you're, you're kind of tall. <laughs> it's because of this obnoxious. that I assume the average age of the studio audience member, 65. That was a very polite and together group laugh. Usually studio audience laughter is a little mm. more organic than that. And yeah. I do I do wonder also, now that we're talking about this, for a DVD release or, mm, or a streaming yeah. release, do you get your syringe out and inject some laughs in? I bet, be, I bet, yeah. I bet so. Because it's absurd. Yeah. And, it, and like you said, it's, it's so 
Just sounded too uniform neat. and neat. Yeah. There are also moments where someone bursts out laughing uncontrollably where I'm so, no one would. No. It's not possible. <laughs> We're going to the lodge, guys. Hey, I hope you're comfortable and ready for the saggiest human bodies you've ever seen. <laughs> I was impressed by these male actors who just did not... I mean, I know they're getting paid, they're professionals, but they did not give a shit about the camera zooming in on them with their shirts off, sweaty, in some cases hairy and old, and that's just... I know that's what happens with time. It's no big deal, but yeah. I'm impressed that they didn't give a shit and they just filmed the scene. There's not an amount of money you could pay me to be on camera in... This no is shirt. incredible body positivity yes. and courage from these guys. There is absolutely an amount of money I could be paid <laughs> to do that and never work again. But mm. it's like, you know, high definition zoomed in on your body. What yeah. a what a horrible thing to endure. I think I would be able to do it, but it would take a lot of like Xanax or something. Yeah. Are you allowed to do a bunch of pre-grooming too? Because I guess I would that, would so. yeah. that would help. That would help. I'm not going natural. <laughs> I actually now think I'd natural. let, I'd go max out. I'd like, give me a year and I come in like a thicket man. Like a Bigfoot. <laughs> well, can't and see these anything. guys kind of look like that. So I, I mean, there's some back hair here. <laughs> and again, we're not criticizing that. No, it's no. What happens to Spencer's point, I just don't understand how they're comfortable enough with themselves to be able to I, do Yeah, because I, I would not, not We're just marveling at their courage. No, we're not saying they did anything wrong. Not we're just bit. saying we can't do yeah, that no. shit. <laughs> so I'm super impressed. For like background extra work where you get but like I guess 500 I should, bucks or something? I'll go ahead know. and say what we're talking about. No, let's just talk about dirty, nude old men for a while. <laughs> we're going to be doing that more True. somehow. Robert and Ray are at this lodge and they have like a big camera, the kind you would have in 1999, <laughs> uh, that probably weighs 30, 40 pounds. They're going to interview some of Frank's friends and lodge mates to try and get, you know, positive testimonials for a tribute video. They arrive, they are greeted by just an array of nude, wet, elderly men, which is what we've been talking about. These are all guys who just came out of the sauna. This is one of those lodges. Again, you smoke cigars, you go take a steam, you bathe with the other men, you might slap them with a towel and, and be like, you need to get that checked. You know, there was this one time when I was young, maybe 11 or 12 or something or other, it was the middle of summer, so we were out of school, I was camping with my grandfather, and it was like a week. And at this campground place, they did have showers that you could use oh, no. whenever. The memory and the story I'm telling is that I went in to go to the bathroom and there was, I don't know, a handful of guys in there who were just doing whatever, going to the bathroom, washing their hands, something or other. But there was one old man who just dick out, just pointing at everything, just waving it at, and I don't understand the old man comfort. Was it Lyndon Baines Johnson? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it was that big. What's the name of his penis again, Van? Jumbo. Thank you. Do you think it's confidence or do you think it's an I, amount of like, who? I think it's who, like they don't give a shit. They're I'm going to die soon. Like, look at this penis. You know, you said your dad had that from growing up with a thousand siblings. Yeah. Like you just didn't care what yeah. people saw because he was he'd, constantly he'd already 85% that. nude. <laughs> I wonder if some people of that generation just grew up that way and that's just how it is and they don't yeah. care who sees it. I think it is that for that generation. I think as we start getting younger, it's a little more somebody wants to be someone to be uncomfortable. Huh. I think there's that. I, that's such the opposite viewpoint I would ever take with anything that I just can't imagine there's yeah. anyone like that. I just can't. I assume anyone who really wants to, sh like, uh, nonchalantly walk around nude now, you know, they want to show off those gains from the gym. <laughs> and maybe these guys at the lodge are trying to do that, too. Maybe they look ripped. We don't know. <laughs> there's <laughs> one guy that people. looks like about as good a shape as you could be, and one of them is kind of sinewy. And, and <laughs> it's like the third guy they talk to, I think. <laughs> Well, the first guy they uh, walk up to, this oddly shaped man, explains to Ray, everybody's nude because it's just sort of what we do. <laughs> we like to walk around nude and be as wet as we can. We're all kind of intermittently jumping in the pool one at a time, which you know they're having extras do or adding in a sound effect because that could kill any one of these old men. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Robert has the big camera out and Ray's like, I don't think you, we should you film keep these. saying that. You keep saying this big camera. <laughs> yeah. It looks so tiny in his hands, though. <laughs> yeah, why did Ray have a huge 40-pound camera and then Robert had one of those disposable cameras you get at Walmart or it's used to get? Weird they filmed it that way. Hmm. But oh, well. Strange. Robert insists, though, no, we can film these old men. They don't care if we see their penises and, and balls and things like that, as you can tell. <laughs> Does ever bait him? <laughs> the uh, first guy introduces himself as Bullethead, <laughs> which is a thing I say when my cat 
pulls his ears back and gets his head into a little bullet shape. Yeah. So this was a lot of fun for me to hear. And I, I actually liked it. thought he said mullet head. I was, oh, I, I was, wish. that whole scene, I was thinking mullet head, which made sense. He had like a bald mullet. What do you think bullet head comes from? What kind of a nickname is bullet head? Probably got shot in the head at one point. <laughs> I thought briefly that it might have been like a, a sexual kind of, or not sexual, but a, a junk joke. I guess you say the head is bullet shaped. Gross. It could be because they're all in the lodge all the time like this. And they're they, always nude. They're probably start, you know, a nickname could emerge from what your penis looks like. Sure. See, this is why we don't do this sort of thing. No. I, ah, can you guys even imagine your retirement age? That's how you're going to spend your final years? Like going no to a lodge like way. that and hanging out with a bunch of other old men naked and sweaty all the time? No, I haven't done that the rest of my life. Why am I going <laughs> to start doing that? Well, that I think we're awful. learning as we get, you know, the world gets older or whatever and the different generations come in that we just don't need as much social as we thought we did. We need more than some people claim yeah. as a species. But I think it's partly like people, you know, you get the old people who complain, back in my day, the whole neighborhood got together and knew each <laughs> other. And now people are like, I don't give a shit about you know, the no one yeah. likes down neighbors, that way. No. A lot of that was built in as like, because like you said, Van, everybody does need to socialize some, of course. But like a lot of that's built in to uphold certain things. You know, kind of like everybody needs to go to an office every day. Some people, I'm sure, do, but like not everyone does, and you can't force people to be part of a thing. You know, or hope, I mean, you can. There's also kind of the unhealthy sort of neighborhood thing where once you're accepted into the neighborhood circle or whatever, it's almost like a tribe, and you're hostile to outsiders, and maybe somebody new on the street that invades the territory doesn't fit in and they get weeded out or whatever. There's, yeah, it's some there's desperate that housewife whole, shit. That whole gatekeeping sort of aspect that neighborhoods could also form that's toxic. You know what else it can form? A situation where anytime you get home, you look around and be like, oh, somebody going to try and talk to me before I go, <laughs> go get inside. Yeah, that'd be awful. Robert, he has his camera zoomed in at Bullethead's package at this point in time. Once he is able to bring the camera up, though, Bullethead says, I hate Frank. He sucks. <laughs> I don't know why you're asking me about this guy. At this point, all of us probably think, why is Frank man of the year? Why is Frank man of the year? Well, the next guy speculates is because they are, quote unquote, down to him. That kind of reveals to us that people have died. Everyone else has kind of already been chosen that's a member of this lodge. I guess we just kind of have to choose Frank. Do you think they really do hate him as much as it seems by the ten oh, times episodes they, over? I bet they do. He's well, awful. But do you, he is. But also, I could see them kind of making it a thing where they're like, "No, that's just what old guys do." Yeah. Josh each other like that. And they really are his friends. I don't know. I, I do think, they, think hate him. they really do dislike him. But like a lot of good old boys, you know, you put up with just about anything to keep a member of your tribe that's that's like you. Next up, guess what? We're going to meet Frank's poker friends. It's Uncle Leo from Seinfeld and <laughs> Dr. Wexler from Seinfeld. You know what? I always wanted to know what they look like nude. Have you ever fantasized about that? Sure. Of all the people that appear on Seinfeld. You know, you're sitting there watching the uh, Junior Fruit. Junior Fruit? Huh. You're sitting there watching the Junior Mint episode, and you think, I want to see what this guy looks like naked. You know, there's a Juji Fruit episode. There is, yeah. I can yeah. see where you got yeah. that mixed junior in your fruit. head. Fruit that's not a senior yet. This fruit's a little smaller than I would <laughs> I would prefer. I'm I'm still hungry. Uh, this fruit <laughs> over here is the third. <laughs> Uncle Leo says Frank owes him fifty bucks. Doctor Wexler says Frank hit his car and never paid for the damage. Frank's a stand up guy, but as we've established, not as stand up as Brad Garrett. He stands up the <laughs> tallest. These old guys continue to yell that Frank is a liar, real piece of shit. But they <laughs> they really do like Ray and Brad Garrett. They're like, you guys come anytime. We love you guys. We're glad you're here. <laughs> Do you think the actors, because of course they can't show them their full naked bodies, do you think the actors were actually naked even though they didn't have to be? I thought exa about this, exactly this when watching it. I don't think so, because... There's just, not but, even a hint to the shorts, though, that they yeah. would have... I, maybe it was like a Speedo or something like that they're wearing. Like a skin-tight Speedo. Yeah. I was thinking Speedo as well, and perhaps like flesh-colored yeah. to match. It's just wet pants. The only one I did wonder about is Bullethead, because of the like, <laughs> steely reserve in his eyes yeah. that kind of matches a man whose penis is out confidently. Yeah. Do you think he, he would just... Like, they told him, you don't have to actually be naked. He's like, no, I want to be naked. I'm going to do this like, This whole is thing. how I always act. <laughs> a couple of alpha boys in here like, no, I'm going to be nude. Bullethead's like, I, I've actually only played corpses before on <laughs> autopsy tables. This is my first time being a live nude old man. I really want to do this. The method actor. <laughs> Ray suggests everyone hates their dad, 
So why don't they go ahead and make up stuff for a tribute video? They go ahead and ask all the old men what they think about chocolate, record that, and then start splicing it all together to make a tribute video. Next, we see the tribute video, and yeah, what a work of cinema. It's got poster board that says Frank Barone Man of the Year written on it, and then we hear just a series of the nude wet men say things they like about chocolate out of context with Frank Barone tacked on at the end to make it sound like they like Frank. Some of this is pretty funny. Yeah, it's not yeah, bad. Yeah, there are some funny bits, but also you have to do the suspension of disbelief and just be like, okay, this is a comedy. Yes. This is a scene where if you focus too much on it, you would think no one's dumb enough to think that this would work. Oh, I love Frank Barone. He is delicious and chocolatey. You know, it's, it's too yeah. much. But of all the terrible shit in this show, this was fine. The guy that turns around and says, mm, 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 <laughs> he's the real winner in this scene. Like you said, Van, it is kind of absurdist in a way a lot of the show isn't. Mm -hmm. I like that about this show, that they'll put stuff like that in there, but it doesn't feel accurate. Like, it feels kind of out of place sometimes. There's also the Kenny G version of Hero by Mariah Carey playing in the background the whole time. Oh, that happens again later. I didn't notice this one, though. I'm mm. glad you did. Exceptionally sick and sinusy Van here. Guess what? We forgot to put in an ad break, so we're going to do it now. Deal with it. It's time for Frank's big ceremony. Frank's seen the video, though. He's seen this fake tribute video, and he hates it. He says it's too short. Uh, the, the boys were careless. He's offended by their lack of appropriate, uh, I don't know, time and effort put into this video for him that I don't know what the time frame is. Was this yesterday he got the award? Could have been three months. It doesn't, we don't seem, it doesn't seem like it was very long. And I think given their the source material they had to work with, they did a hell of a job. Yeah. The best, the best you could do. I don't know what you do with a, a tribute to someone you don't like and no one likes. In high school, I had AP uh, <laughs> political science. Really reaching now to get us off track from the episode that you hate. <laughs> I'm gonna do it though. <laughs> we had to do this thing where, and famously, this is in Republic, Missouri. My friend Kendall and I, who you guys of course know, were the only two people in this entire school system who did not identify as hardcore Republican. And this is in the Bush era. This is like 2000. So anyway, political science class, the teacher has a hat full of just random politicians. Jimmy Carter's there, JFK, that you have to reach into the hat and whoever, whatever name you get, you have to create a campaign for that politician. Reached into the hat, pulled out fucking George W. Bush. Oh, that is rough. So we just made a facetious bullshit video. Could you draw like Caesar out of the hat? That, yes, there were like long-term I think it would be people. fun to get someone from like thousands of years mm -hmm. ago. Kendall did blackface in that video. Oh, oh no. no. We didn't know what we were doing. No, yeah, of course. No, no, we were but, like, yeah. what, 13 or whatever. But yeah. he was Al Roker. The good thing that Kendall didn't try to start a political career because you could ruin him with that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Kendall's political career. <laughs> I may not win president, but Frank did win man of the year, guys. He's leaving the lodge, though. That's how mad he is about this video. He doesn't even want to, like, see anyone or take part in the man of the year ceremony. Didn't so even he didn't finish his steak. No. So he and Marie, they go ahead and leave. Robert and Ray look on kind of regretfully at this point. Robert says we should have dressed in drag. This would have all been fine. That's a polite way of putting the word he used. I'm going to use it you because they go, keep doing it yeah, in the show. Yes, it's a running joke. He says, we should have dressed like broads. Yeah. <laughs> I haven't heard the word broads <laughs> this much than, in, than I've seen in these two episodes of Everybody Love Raymond ever. Yeah, and this is another thing where I don't know what... The joke is exactly lady men dressing like ladies. Yeah, I mean, it's like so that's funny, the joke, Brian. but it's so funny. Repeating broads over and over again, it's kind of like I know they're trying to use them as blunt instruments, or just Robert, really, and Frank later as like blunt instruments to just say broads carelessly, but it's not funny at all and serves no dramatic purpose either. Piano flourish. <laughs> Back at the Barone parents' house, Marie questions Frank on why exactly he is so mad. And he says, it's my kids, Murray. There's a guy named Tom who apparently got a 37-minute video. And he wishes he could be like Tom. He wishes anyone loved him. Too long. Too long for a tribute video. Maybe it but, was Tom Scarrett. You know, in this case, not, not long, long enough. enough. You know what they did at the end of Tom's tribute video is they dressed up like broads, as the show would say, mm -hmm. and they did a big dance number. So that's, uh, that's what actually Frank wanted the whole time. Marie has the actual funniest moment in this scene to me when she quickly sucks up for Robert and says, Robbie wanted to dress up for you. 
Marie is always doting on both of her kids, but prefers Raymond by a lot. Really? Yes. I did not get that vibe from these two. Now, that's just the episodes we have, but yeah. I find that interesting. She's very protective over Robert, but she actually, like, Raymond being younger, she dotes on him and really loves him. Also, Robert is the reason she had to marry Frank, which is a big... She got knocked up. Yes, and this comes up later that she thinks she treats Robert worse unintentionally because of kind of dealing with that. You know, fun sitcom stuff. <laughs> Oh, speaking of fun sitcom stuff, buckle up, kids, because we're no longer watching Everybody no. Loves Raymond. We're watching Everybody Gets Uncomfortable watching Everybody Loves Raymond. Yes. Yeah, that's where the episode just takes a sharp turn here. That's the rest of it. So at this point, we're halfway through the episode and it takes a turn. We go from what you kind of expect from a sitcom into something else. It's not the same kind of episode. I hope no one liked talking about Ray and Robert because that's all yeah. for them. This is uh, mostly a, I mean, pretty much just is a two-hander with Frank and Marie at this point, and they're both good actors, so there is that. Frank is so mad, at some point in this, he says that Ray and Robert can't even come back over to the house. They're banned <laughs> from what they've done. <laughs> Marie asserts that Frank is actually mad at his lodge pals because they hate him. They had nothing nice to say, as Spencer said earlier. There's no source material for your kids to even make a tribute video. Frank kind of realizes it at this point, but instead of apologizing or trying to process it or communicate, he just turns away wordlessly and goes into the living room to watch whatever this is. I got pickles for toes and a root to make a <laughs> Frank, what are you doing? I'm watching. That's a fresh hair and the melon over there. <laughs> Come on. Shut that off, please. Quiet. I can't hear. Yeah, so that's what Frank finds more important than his family. We find out later it's the veggie wedge man. That's <laughs> yeah. what it's called. And I would rather watch the we veggie wedge man. Maybe one day we'll cover the veggie wedge man <laughs> on Boob Two Boys. Here you can see Frank and Marie's couch, and it is covered in plastic. Oh, man, that was a thing back then, yes. I guess. Yes, and weird floral patterns. My grandparents did it. I, and it's this... every suburbanite's dream to have a plastic-covered couch. That way you can just keep the same one forever. I like how everything looks in here. It looks very accurate in this living room. And by accurate, I mean kind of crappy. And I didn't know whose house was what, so this <laughs> clears up a little bit more that it is this old lady's house, basically. Yeah. Because it is just hideous top to bottom. After a little bit of prodding from Marie, Frank turns the TV off and says, I'm quitting the lodge. And Marie, to his surprise, says, good. <laughs> mm -hmm. She accurately says these guys really think they're all there is to life as being nude and sweating a lot together. He neglected to mention that after he turned off the show, Frank referred to the veggie wedge man as stupid crap, <laughs> which I believe he accidentally meant to say amazing art. <laughs> also, a thing that I don't like and never did is that Frank's catchphrase is to just say crap a lot. Is that it? Yeah. Wow, that's, yeah, that's lazy. It's super lazy, which I think a lot of the writing is, even though critically, I guess it was thought of as pretty good. Well, every time I would look on IMDb for a factoid or something or other, there's always a thing at the bottom that was like, this was mentioned in the 94th Primetime Emmy Awards. Yeah. Why? Yeah, it's, it's a little confounding in some way. Frank sets off the real big conflict now. Marie says, Frank, let's go ahead and go to bed. But as she's walking off, Frank asks, hey, what would you say? And right here, Peter Boyle, with his weird, tired, kind of gentle delivery, has this kind of like narcissist vulnerability. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. it's really good. This one little moment from him, I was like, oh, man. Yeah, it certainly came out really well. His character is not especially well written, but no. he does quite a bit with this one little thing here that he's supposed to be a... He's supposed to be an asshole who's mean to everyone, but in this moment, he's vulnerable, and he shows it perfectly. Yeah, his face just turns. It's one of those. And it's filmed from top kind of down, angled, which gives him the appearance of being small and frightened, yeah. which also adds to it. So good job, cinematographer. No, it's, it's, it's legitimately really good. Like, uh, there's a lot of stuff from here on out that I think is pretty good. I and think stuff I, that I don't think I is good. I like a lot of actors on this show. Yeah. Hate a lot of characters on this show. That's <laughs> yeah. just kind of oh, how that's it is. A, that's a good way that's to put it. That's definitely the way to put it. Marie tells him, she says to Frank, what I will tell you is you have a bunch of kids and grandkids. Here's some factoids. That's what this was. <laughs> and Frank, as I would, says, that's it? I mean, <laughs> she's just recited like what his loins have produced effectively. <laughs> that's not really who he is. 
Marie stops again and still really doesn't say anything, but she's trying. She says, well, I love you. You're the one for me still. Whatever I did to deserve you, I'll live with it. Ending on a cheesy joke, and this is a recurring thing where Frank says, with the humor, after someone says a joke that it really didn't work for me at all. The other thing, too, is I think there are two ways she should have done this. If she's still buying in, even though you know who Frank is, just make a bunch of stupid shit up and get him happy. Or the other option is realize that your marriage sucks because he's a fucking piece of shit and get out. Mm. I don't know. I felt like her initial reaction, struggling to say something or whatever. If I'm looking at this realistically, she's had her whole life to know a couple of things that will make him happy. And she would just say them, spout them right off. I don't think she's trying to make him happy. I think she's genuinely trying to answer the question and he's not. And I think that's kind of the, the conflict there. But in that regard, that she knows he's not, right? She wouldn't know. This yeah. isn't a new thing. I think thing. that's the point, is she doesn't exactly know what to say. Like she, They she, don't have that kind of marriage they where don't. they would say stuff like that to each other. They're very closed off in ways that even, there are a lot of scenes, like most episodes have a scene, which is weird that we didn't get one, of Ray and Deborah in bed together talking. Raymond also is very closed off and acts like a big boy in a lot of ways and won't be open with his emotions, <laughs> just jokes around. A nicer version of the Frank thing. He right. takes the middle ground, he won't argue. Now, Frank, <laughs> same version of the thing, he's just mean all of the time. And their discussions before bed or whatever, Marie and Frank's typically don't exist at all. <laughs> they just don't talk. Which I suppose is realistic of couples of that era and that generation. It's especially yeah. common on TV shows that want to, they yeah. want to introduce that dynamic between an older couple who's been married for a long time. I'm sure it happens. I'm sure it exists, but TV has made it such a cliche that I get tired of it. And their relationship of not being able to talk about anything, it struck me as kind of flat and lazy in this episode. And I agree with you. I think overall, I don't know that, I would say that more relationships are probably not that in real life. Like that's played up to such a degree. Surely. But I really don't know. My grandparents were married for 50 some odd years and there were some really, obviously good things, but bitterness. There, mm. there was a, <laughs> saying this on my podcast, but <laughs> yeah, well, there was though. And I think that's built in if you're with someone your whole life. You know, there, there are certain things you just can't, you know that person almost entirely too well, or you think you do, one of the two. <laughs> but I agree, this is a trope. This is something that's in every sitcom I like that this episode addresses it. Most episodes of the show don't. You know, they just fight. You know, there, there's not really anyone saying, hey, this is messed up. You're right. I can agree with that. My counter argument would be, why is everybody loves Raymond bothering? <laughs> yeah. I doubt, I sincerely doubt, ever, ELR, as I like to put it <laughs> in my notes, ever really tackled a lot of subjects Serious. or topics they tried a lot Did like they? that okay. this is what that they makes a little sense. so they wanted to have their cake and eat it too and that's actually we'll talk about this when we talk about the series in general one of the things i like about the show is its ambition but that's also one of the things that makes it a little worse because it doesn't it, succeed it does not pick a lane yeah it, it often tries to do things like this and because it does as you said van have mostly a very good cast it half pulls off stuff and again, it's like, it's a bunch of half measures. Mm -hmm. Then you said this is CBS, right? Yeah. As we've all agreed, if these actors in this, in this scene specifically, if they were reading from a script that was not limited to a CBS kind of thing, could have been they good. could kill it. I, it would have been absolutely. amazing. I would, it, okay. Would you watch a drama <laughs> <laughs> with Peter Boyle and Doris Roberts just as an old married couple, like the, it's the center yeah, of them. Yeah, with and they like have, no gloves off and they're actually, they hate each other and they can say real stuff. Yeah, and like Fuck, someone yeah. someone who can write, wrote it. Oh, like I would someone, love that. Oh, man. It's like 11 episodes in a season as opposed <clears throat> to 28 or whatever. I would, I would watch that. <clears throat> yeah. They could even play. Get they, them younged up. They could even play like they could redo uh, Death of a Salesman drama oh. dramatization Ooh. and they could he could be Willie Beeman and that could be his wife and they'd be amazing That, that. would be fantastic. Now that you've said these Willie better Beeman, options, I think I, is that his name, or I is think that the is. guy in? Is that the guy in? Fri What's the movie that it's about? Jamie Fox and he's a football player and he's a big deal. Oh, <laughs> the Amazing Spider-Man. Any too. given Sunday. <laughs> Any given Sunday. I was going to say Friday Night Lights, uh, but it's not that. <laughs> so isn't his name Willie Beeman? I that? don't remember Steeman that. Steeman Willie fact. Beeman. Steeman. You can beat me. You're dreaming. <laughs> 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 anyway. 
Willie Loman, I think, is the death of a salesman. This is very funny that I've, if I, if I'm correct, that I've mixed up those two. (laughs) But in any case, I think that if they were given the script, they would be very good. It's not their fault. Loman? Yeah, I think it's Loman. Yeah. Okay. Willie Beeman. Beeman, Willie Beeman. (laughs) Also, Marie says, what else is new? And I hate that. That's one of your pet peeves. Once Marie's done with her tribute, again, Peter Boyle nails looking relieved. He looks like, oh, man, the world doesn't all hate me. My wife, who I verbally abuse, <laughs> says I'm great. And she never really did give him anything all that great, honestly. No. He no, shouldn't have been happy with she it. She also struggles to fully open up. She just wants to. That's the big difference here. And he always beats that down. <laughs> <laughs> so enough years of that might do this. Marie asks Frank to reciprocate that basic, very oh, no. basic tribute. Frank then panics and starts to go to bed. Second best face he makes is the second she starts saying, well, what would my tribute yeah. be about? <laughs> His eyes grow wide and yeah, uh, good. She says, oh, you got what you wanted and now you're done. What else is new? Ooh, I put down a little note at that point. Frank sleeps right after he fucks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's a hurried spurter and then he gets <laughs> off to his own counting of sheep. <laughs> Marie makes him crinkle his ass back onto the couch while he whines about having to talk more. She wants to have this conversation. Frank says this is all stupid. It was even stupid when you complimented me. I don't even want that one anymore. He finally gives in and says, all right, Marie, I'm going to give you a compliment. And this is just so she'll shut up and go to bed. He doesn't mean any of this. And then he doesn't even give her uh, anything at all. He says, you spit when you talk because he gets annoyed that she kind of sits up straight and poofs her hair up in anticipation of the compliment. Just a a, a deep running hatred between them. (laughs) The one thing that does absolutely work for me in this scene is while all this dramatic stuff's going off, whether or not I think they pulled it off or not, there's a hokey veggie wedge man song. Yes. Like banjo right in the background the whole time. Yeah, the the offsetting or like the kind of juxtaposition of that I think does work for me. Marie turns around. She's going to go to bed at this point. Fuck Frank. He can sleep on the crinkly couch. She's staring daggers into him. And then she says something that a lot of men Frank's age should probably be told by their loved ones. You want to know why people don't love you, Frank? You want to know? Because you offer them nothing. That's right. You have to give love, Frank, to get it. And you have never, ever been willing to do that. You just take and take and take and expect everybody to accept your obnoxious horse's ass of a personality. And everybody has to put up with it because it's you. Why is anyone laughing? Get his ass. Yeah, I That's what I didn't get. I I, I was sitting there watching like this fucking rules. Like, and she was, you know, she was giving it to him. And everyone's like, she said a, a harsh word. Let's laugh. We don't even understand. And I think, Van, that's, you know, you've been beating this drum. And I think you're right. The tonal shift. It's confused the audience, (laughs) potentially. Yeah, it's a lot darker than they were prepared for. I thought in that part where she's tearing him down, it struck me as she could be like, you push everyone away almost as if you're a very narrowly drawn character in a TV (laughs) show providing comic relief. I hate my wife. (laughs) I look like that football player who does all the the shows before Terry Bradshaw. Yeah, Yeah. that's the one. They do look the same. I'm really glad you picked up on that so fast. (laughs) <laughs> After she delivers this line, Marie turns to go to bed. Frank turns the Blink Block Kids show back on. It's right back to, what, Captain Octopus or something? The Veggie Wedge show. Yeah, the Veggie Wedge show. This makes Marie really mad, and she turns back one more time and tells him that adult people should talk about their problems and not sit there and watch the vegetable show. And he realizes the error of his way yeah. and turns to speak to her. Or And we get a resolution. The episode wraps up neatly. Nope. Fast forward to a few hours later, Frank wakes up during a sandwich commercial and says yes to it. (laughs) I like that. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, that's cute. (laughs) Which is, most of the jokes that work, that's what I have to say about them. You know what? I completely forgot to tell this story months ago and it'll be more relevant, but I'm going to do it now because I want to get it out there in the airwaves. Yeah. I did a watch of the Mission Impossible movies. We were sitting and watching, I think the fourth one, Katie and I were my girlfriend, in bed And she dozes off. And Jeremy Renner's in that one. And we all know Jeremy Renner is a real life hero. He's a real superhero (laughs) in a world of mortals. Anyway, she wakes up out of the middle of the nowhere when he does his little Jeremy Renner bit, looks at the television, and she's been dead asleep for a while. And she goes, fucking hate Jeremy Renner. (laughs) Rolls back over and goes to sleep. Came from nowhere. Another very primal reaction to something, just like Frank has with Sandwich. 
it tri- <laughs> it's like a, a real deep sleep trigger to just pull you out of it with nothing but your emotional response. And it's so excited. He really does want a sandwich. <laughs> just as Katie wanted everyone to know <laughs> her true feelings. You know what? As an actor, I kind of like Jeremy Renner. He's good sometimes. As a person, kind of a doofus. Uh, anyone who has their own app, like for themselves, like the Jeremy Renner app, mm-hmm. that's not, I can't like that person. Very I much. can't support the acting career anymore. When he no. started, sure, but it's become too much Avengers at the, yeah. the recent years. We get it. You can shoot arrows good. <laughs> That's his only thing, right? He doesn't yeah, I have, think like, so. laser beam him. eyes. I think his other thing is he has a wife. Yeah. Oh. And, like, a kid. And, like, they, his own that's house. The new one. Those arrows. Like, out in the middle of nowhere. Those arrows didn't stop that snowmobile. <laughs> 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 I think he's got some acreage. Realizing it's late, Frank decides not to eat a sandwich. He goes up and tries to sneak into bed with Marie without her noticing. Because he does not want to have this conversation, especially not in the middle of the night. He's got to mm. get up and do nothing tomorrow. He's retired. He doesn't have any luck, though. Marie's wide awake, and once he, once Frank has stripped down to his undies and everything and gets in bed, Marie reveals she's awake, and Frank says his cool catchphrase, oh, crap. And the <laughs> audience fucking loses oh, it. They love, it, oh, crap. This is one of those that makes me mad, because it's like, the joke here is, uh, ladies always want to talk yeah. about their emotions. With their skincare products all over their face. Yep. Yeah, because as Marie turns, we see she's got a nighttime facial mask on, which is really funny, because especially <laughs> in 1999. There's nothing funnier than skincare. <laughs> what a terrible, stupid idea. Yeah. Who would want to age better? <laughs> I like that there are total grandparent-style pictures and picture frames all over the place mm-hmm. here. Again, felt... Felt good to me. Felt real. And wallpaper that's busy. Busy is quite the word for it. (laughs) Marie turns on the lights, and this is actually when she reveals that mask we mentioned. Frank says, oh, I was attacked by a kabuki. Uh, A kabuki. A kabuki, (laughs) yes. Which, if you say that line to me, I would think you're talking about Sergeant Kabuki Man. NYPD? Yes. Yes. Troma's finest. If if Peter Boyle got in bed with you and told you he was attacked Correct. by that, that's mm-hmm. what you would think. Okay. First thing that would pop in your mind is, is that. <laughs> yeah. Sergeant Kabuki Man. You're like, you know, I need to check out Sergeant Kabuki Man yeah, I wonder what, what Toxic Avenger's up to. <laughs> <laughs> or Tromeo and Juliet. <laughs> Frank tries to preempt any real conversation. He offers a really rushed apology and says, I know it wasn't Robert and Ray's fault that everything went wrong. Nobody likes me and it's my fault because I suck. I'm sorry to everyone. Murray says, no, that's not an actual apology at all. You just want me to shut up. And Frank shrugs. Again, not hiding it at all. He is an open sociopath. (laughs) And, you know, we've seen a lot of sitcoms with the cranky old man trope. But this is the meanest of all of them. He is super mean, and that's that's a constant. I'll add one thing about him. One of the few things that keeps him likable throughout the run, or that they add in, Marie, because of her weird thing with Ray and how she believes he's some gift from God, is always mean to Deborah and overly critical. Essentially, she doesn't believe anyone could be good enough for her Raymond. Frank stands up for Deborah all the time, but does not realize he'll stand up for Deborah for the same things he will not stand up for Marie for. Right. Yeah. That sort of thing. Hmm. So I think the writers are intending to use that to offset some yeah, that's of That's a little he's... nuance. Yeah, you know? it's it's something. Yeah. I have mixed feelings about him being so mean. Like on one hand, I like it because he's so fucking mean. Like, mm-hmm. he's worse than any of these, as you said, Van, these sitcom grandpas. On the other hand, it, it sticks out like a sore thumb sometimes. And there's a thing about unlikable characters. You can like them, but it has to be done the right way, and that's a fine line, and the line was crossed for me with Frank. Yeah, you know, I remember famously, Spencer, in the King of Queens episode we covered in Christmas, you talked about how mean Jerry Stiller's character was. To, uh, to Patton Oswalt and everybody. Mm-hmm. Oh, and the, the dog walker lady. Anyway, who's meaner, Frank or him in that episode? I think Frank in, in this episode is about as mean as anyone. He's so one note mean. There's And I kept waiting for the other shoe to drop in this episode where it was like, okay, here's where he shows his soft side finally at long last and this is why she's with them or whatever. And it just never really came. No, he doesn't do it. And to your point, Spencer, Marie Wright, Right around here asks, okay, what do you have to say to me now? Do you have anything nice to say? Frank says, let me sleep on it. Ha ha. I'm an asshole. We've made nine jokes in a row that say I'm an asshole. (laughs) Marie's really upset. 
Frank continues to make jokes to deflect, just as Raymond would in a different way. You know, like father, like son. (laughs) Frank notices Marie is crying now as she's turned away from him, so he goes to the bathroom. At this point, I think what's going to happen is what you guys said. I think he's going to maybe go to her side of the bed, kneel down, and just let loose. Like, have a bit of an emotional moment with her. If he would have just burst into tears, <laughs> it could have worked. I, I would have been so horrified well, at yeah. the tonal shift that I, I would have been like, I think I like <laughs> this show. I, I, <laughs> I'm upset and disturbed, and I don't know what's going on. No, that's not what Frank's doing. He's getting a washcloth, because when I heard the water, I thought he was getting her a glass of water. That would be nice. Something, She's been sure. crying, and they've been talking. No, he's getting a washcloth, wetting it down, <laughs> And then grabs her face and then wipes all of her face mask (laughs) off and says, I like you better without the crap on your face. The two then embrace. Marie realizes that he's the love of her life. Say things like that to me every day, Marie says. So wonderful. They ruined her skincare routine. What a great thing to do. How is this the line they decided would fix the relationship for the episode? Because uh, she's so. Did they just run out of time? She's so beautiful that he can't stand to have anything covering her face when they talk, I guess. I don't know what emotion they, did they think this was cute? Yeah. I was uncomfortable. I thought he the whole time. rubbed her face really hard. Yeah. She was like shaking underneath the rag that he was using on her. It looked uncomfortable for her and it was not anything that she should have been like, that's so sweet. That's yeah. my husband. I put myself in those shoes and I've pissed off my wife or girlfriend or whatever and they're sobbing and I... Br- just roughly rub them them their face and just start mooshing a washcloth <laughs> on their face because of the bullshit that's on their that face. That would be I like, get it. I would, I would have expected her to beat him off her at that yeah. point. Not, not be like, no, I love you. That's so sweet. Do you or guys think this is an ape like show of love, like in a grooming way? Okay. You've made it make sense. <laughs> that's the only, I, I can go with that as much as anything. Yeah. This, this sucks. I feel like honestly, this second half of the episode, honestly, the episode could have panned out, worked a lot better in terms of my enjoyment or appreciation if they had ended stronger than this. This just doesn't. And I actually, I don't think the right call is to have Frank show complete contrition. That's not what his character is. But I think you could find a better way to show a small uh, a small amount of love like this that isn't aggressive and terrifying. <laughs> Whatever they went with here, I didn't get it, and I didn't feel like it redeemed him in any way, and I don't know why she would think so. Nope. Frank then says to Marie, I'm man of the year, looking to move up from man once a year. You are just sobbing at me. Let's fuck. Absolutely. You know what's the best lube, according to Frank? The sadness of 50 years down the drain. <laughs> After this, he ends his sentence with with the humor, like he did earlier. It's mm-hmm. a, a, a callback back. That, that sucks, and it's not funny. And they kiss, by the way, here. And apparently, yeah. factoid, this is the only time in the entire series run that those two actors kiss. I Maybe no one liked that. it. It was like, that's, this is only season three. Let's not do that again the rest of the way. <laughs> <laughs> also, we waited this long, so <laughs> ah, we don't need to ever do it again. Let's take a little trip to Ray and Deborah's house to end the episode. We haven't been there yet. The couple, the and they're a lot younger than the couple we've been seeing. <laughs> I, you know, and they're probably like mid thirties or something here. But because I've seen Marie and Frank for so long, when they switch them, I'm like, who are these teenagers? <laughs> Plus, having watched the show when you were younger, you probably just perpetually associate Ray Romano with being older than you. I do. So you see him here when he may not even be, and you still think like I still looked at them and thought, oh, those are my elders, you know, and they're they are they're probably not even forty in the scene. <laughs> yeah. So this Spencer, this is so funny. So I had this exact thought. I was thinking about how old Ray Romano was at the time, and I was like. Yeah, a little older than me. And then I stopped and was like, no, there's no way. <laughs> and then I was like, how do I gauge it now? Because I clearly don't know. And and then I thought, does the actor have totally the same hair color still? Is there no gray in it? Does their skin look smooth and uncraggly? <laughs> they are younger than you, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> so Ray and Deborah are sitting on the couch, and Ray is upset still about the fact that he hurt his dad's feelings, how the whole tribute went. Deborah says it's fine. Who cares? It made me hungry because they were talking about chocolate and I'm a woman. She's in a big fluffy white robe, though, and I actually kind of wanted to be enveloped in that and eat chocolate myself. Far better experience than having watched this episode of Everybody (laughs) Loves Raymond. Ray calls his parents to apologize to his dad. Frank answers in a bit of a, you know, a a fuck frenzy, I would say, (laughs) because he's been banging Ray's mom, who's his wife. Why did you answer the phone? 
<laughs> I, maybe that's part of it. Ugh. Oh, so he gets off on that part of it? Yeah, okay. yeah. Frank hangs up, and I guess Ray just assumes everything's fine, and we, we see a post-coital Frank and Marie. Just mm. what I wanted to see. Just holding one another's still clothed bodies. I've seen Uncle Leo nude. How can I make this hotter? <laughs> I thought he went right to sleep after he fucked. Frank and Marie start joking. They're telling the joke we told to start, like, start the synopsis, yeah. I think, which is they're bitching about Ray and Deborah living so close and calling at all hours, which is the series usually is joking that Frank and Marie are doing that to Ray and Deborah. Reverse of the norm. Hey, let's go to that little piano song that reminds me of either Fraser or Mad About You's theme. And that is the end of this Mad About You episode. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, not going to say it any other way. By the way, Patricia Heaton was only in that final little skit at the very yeah. end with Raymond in bed. It's because she was pregnant during the filming of this episode. So they, of course, had her holding blankets or pillows or whatever to hide it. Well, they shouldn't have already made up three kids they weren't using in the show, <laughs> and they could have given her one then and rolled with it. What do you guys think? What do you think about this episode? Spencer, you haven't said as much about your total loathing as Van. What What do you think? Oh, I didn't. I wouldn't say I absolutely hated it. I just thought the second half of it was very odd. I thought I didn't know. And I didn't know what to expect since I only caught snippets of this on TV when I was younger and never watched a whole episode. I really didn't know what to look for in any of the characters here. Quite frankly, and we'll talk about this next week, I really think that you've got to have more of Ray and Robert shenanigans to make these episodes work for what the show was. So when they kind of went off the different direction here and did that little marriage drama thing with this, I was more confused than anything and didn't really know what to make of the show. The kind of lighthearted stuff they did toward the first half is perfectly fine. It, it is what it is. It's exactly what I expected for CBS television. I pretty much universally agree with you, except a little bit stronger. And yeah, you hated it. I did hate it. And I think <laughs> here's why. I think if you've got this on in the background and you're sticking around on your phone and you occasionally look up and you hear, <laughs> it's fine. You, you giggle if you laugh. Oh, everybody loves Raymond is great. Oh, this is probably a cartoon about a little squirrel and a big bear. <laughs> <laughs> but if you watch this, like I watch Boob Two Boys shows, I'm watching the background in one watch. I'm really paying attention to the dialogue and the way character and just over analyzing it. It's dirty. It's gross. This left a sour bile flavored <laughs> taste in my mouth and i get what they were going for with the redemption arc at the end kind of but like we all said it didn't work mm -mm. they failed at that they sure did and it doesn't help that the first 12 minutes of this show and i still don't buy you about live studio audience <laughs> well just, i don't know either i'm telling you that these are things i read right. versus you're guessing <laughs> and it, fair enough <laughs> but it's it was just canned laughter balls to the wall for 12 minutes no matter yeah. how minute the joke was or how offhand, it was full bore laughter. And it distracts from the yes. serious moments that would, would work otherwise, I think, a lot better. I'd like to check out other sitcoms, maybe from this era, with laugh tracks that I'd watched. Yeah. Because to me, the laugh track or the, the audience took so much away from this episode. But is that because I don't, I don't, I don't watch shows with laugh tracks anymore. Were they all like that? Or was this one just too really I bad? wonder that... Too, but then I thought about it and I'm like, this never bothers me with a good show. Like, I'm never watching Seinfeld and I'm like, wow, I hate that there's people laughing here. But I think that's it too. Like, a good show uses the audience laughter or laugh track to yeah. support the show. This took it over. It also makes a difference, like, if you find the joke funny. Cause, like, well, in Seinfeld, yeah. I'm finding the joke funny. It's kind of fun to laugh with right. people I'm hearing laughing. And everybody loves Raymond. I'm kind of annoyed that they're laughing. <laughs> uh, and that's, you know, that's my thing is the show's not funny enough. It's supposed to be a, a comedy, ostensibly. And in my opinion, the things that work best are, like Spencer said, the light, you know, the kind of airy jokes, like you said, Van, the, the brother. The first 12 minutes is way better the brother than the comedy. 12. Well, it is and it isn't, because then we have the back half, which works up until it undoes itself, I think. Like, whenever they have a non-resolution and M Marie relents for no reason at all, to me, it kind of undermines the fact that I actually was kind of into it for a minute there, mm. like when they were digging into each other, you know, really going after it. So I liked it more than you guys, but I acknowledge that it is all over the place. Our next Raymond episode is not all over the place. It is just a couple of places. It sticks to what it does, and it's better for it. I think it would have been really ballsy if this one had ended with Frank and Marie just 
fucking divorcing. Yeah. If that had been like, yes. that's it for us. That no, would have that, been ballsy as shit. So a couple minutes before it ended, I kind of was like, man, this is not resolving. And what, what can he really do <laughs> at this two. point? <laughs> and I did think, <laughs> I did think there was a chance it just ended with them going to sleep silently knowing they're, they can't That would have been good. It. That would have been better. That to me is how you end this. Mm -hmm. Because you know they're not going to have them actually separate. So maybe just have them kind of wordlessly acknowledge we're fucked until we die. They could roll the <laughs> credits as they looked across, like away from each other in the dark room <laughs> that in silence. And that little piano. Maybe the laugh yeah. track. Perfect. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Full bore. Or Marie says something like, I hope, I hope you go before me. And then the <laughs> audience fucking cracks up. <laughs> you know, when watching this episode, I thought I had to go back and do a thing I often do when we cover heavy topics. Uh -huh. I didn't, but... I did decide there was one thing I wanted to do to lighten the mood, and that's talk YouTube comments. Oh, yeah. About this episode of Everybody Loves Those are Ray. always Don, Don Pierce have anything to say? No, sadly, no. I looked it up. That's too bad because Frank really is as cold as a man. <laughs> <laughs> we have a handful here. Let's talk about Joe Cab. That's who posted this comment. Both man and car. He puts the uh, timestamp in here because on YouTube you can click and it'll take you to that spot. And it's the part where they're showing the video package. And he says, I laughed so hard, my abs cramped. Oh, he's ripped. So this also lends to the credence that it is a live audience. So this guy probably was in the yeah. studio audience. But that's not all. Joe Cab had five replies to this. Most of them, nobody replies to anything. Dennis Pupovic, 27, not one through 26, this is 27, responded with, ha ha, ha ha, <laughs> smiley face, smiley face, sideways crying face because they're laughing so hard. Right. It's funny. His abs also cracked, or whatever this guy said about cracked his abs. Cracked abs. No, cramped, but oh, I my. like cracked, like a crab. <laughs> I need to get to a doctor. Crab abs. <laughs> B.S. Gambotti 1 says, I told you to get rid of that. Quoting, of course, I think Raymond in the show, the thing <laughs> people, about the chocolate. His classic people line. quoting, yeah. everyone loves Raymond at each other is amazing to and me. And like, because there's such vague line. lines, they don't stand out. It's kind of like the oh crap Peter Boyle catchphrase. It isn't anything. <laughs> we also have Ma McMoo, MCMU. The motherly cow. They say, it was cute. See, that's fine. That's fine. And then we have Pride Aviles, who says, Michael Polaris, no it's not. Then I thought, who the hell's Michael Polaris? So I looked. There are only four replies on this comment oh, list, but it says got... five. Mm. Who, who said something that got them kicked off? Michael for Polaris, it? apparently. I wonder what, what you... he said. Yeah. I don't know. Oh, all right. Everybody take their best crack at what Michael Polaris said about everybody loves Raymond to get kicked off. No, it's not, is the answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> I think he said, oh, crap. Oh. <laughs> Can't use that sort of coarse language. All right. We also have George Drivas, who says, only one guy said the name Frank Barone, and they used to call him out the name in every frame. I died. Laughing emoji, laughing emoji, laughing emoji. Oh, okay. oh laughing I emoji. see. They're talking about the tribute video. Yes, so funny. Took me a while to pick up on that, though. But he thought it was so funny he died. Brett Koshal says, Frank Barone is actually like the human version of Jeff Dunham's ventriloquist dummy Walter in a nasty form of society. <laughs> There's so much I don't like about this. <laughs> and he causes Raymond and Robert to edit words together for a wide tribute at the lodge. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sounds like a poor translation happened there. No, I, I kind of think they, they said what they meant to say. <laughs> a wide tribute. I've never heard that before. Would you call it a narrow one? <laughs> I like them tall. I like my tributes like I like my Brad Garrett's. <laughs> <laughs> Massive. James Leopard says, why didn't Frank Barone like his tribute and want to leave and get home so early instead of spending his night at the lodge? Eat that steak. <laughs> this person didn't understand the yeah. plot of the episode. This person probably thinks it's a documentary. <laughs> <laughs> but don't worry. Robert Espinosa is here to answer the question. He says, the tribute made him realize that nobody liked him or that no one has anything nice to say. Oh, I love it when people explain things that it's are painfully the best. obvious. The other guy just thinks, like, that seems like a lovely evening. You get an award, you eat a steak. Why? <laughs> What's the problem? What are you pissed off about? I also love that we record this podcast, like, analyzing every scene of, of TV shows. But most discussion about a TV show is, is things like, why did this character be mean? And the other guy's like, it's a, it's a dramatic device. <laughs> <laughs> this is what television is. <laughs> Dakota Stein also comments on James Leopard's confusion comment and says, if someone said they liked you hot with extra marshmallows, you'd probably want to leave too. We got a little joke around. Really depends who it is. 
Yeah, who's this? A writer, another writer for Coach down there? <laughs> and then rapid fire round. These are a couple other comments I just want to spurt out and then we're done. DJ UK says, just saw this in the UK for the first time. It actually made me cry. That was a year ago that was commented. Uh, I guess that was all for him that he couldn't stand anymore. I didn't, I didn't read anything about a UK version of this. <laughs> I guess, you know, like everybody loves like the, Benedict what's the, Cumberbatch. What's the English version of yeah. Ray? Raymond probably still. <laughs> Becky Migdahl says Peter Boyle should have won an Emmy for that episode. Uh, I don't know about that. He's really good. He's good but, but, a good job. I mean, but, he didn't have enough material to win an Emmy you, for. You can't elevate the writing no. that much. Mm -hmm. You couldn't put anyone in the role that would do much better, but that <laughs> that speaks to the writing's uh, mediocrity to me. Yeah. Natral Schizophrenia says, Aw, my heart. Heart emoji. This is so wholesome. Hmm. They misread this entire thing. Yes, they did. And then finally, we have morbidly obese RoboCop. Morbidly obese right, RoboCop says, idea. he could hear her hair growing, probably wants some soup. Wow. That's horrifying. That's all I got for you. Ugh, talk about feeling gross after something. I feel gross after hearing that. <laughs> we'll be back next week for some more. Uh, no, no, we won't. See, it turns out this is our 99th episode. And we're going to do something a little different for episode number 100. I'm not going to tell anyone what it is. You guys don't get to know. Only the three people on this podcast in this room know what it is. We'll be talking about a TV show, and we'll be doing some other stuff. That's all I'll say. That show, I will say, is something you guys have been clamoring for. Yeah. You want to see it. It's been hear it. It's been sort of hinted at in a roundabout way. But cool stuff. We'll have some special things for our number 100 episode. Yeah. Looking forward to it. New segments, games, weird traditions perhaps being started. Maybe yeah. a ferret. It could be ferrets, carrots, garrets, which uh, reminds me, go on over to Patreon, look up Boo2 Inc., subscribe to that thing. It's free. We do bonus episodes. Sometimes we do quizzes about Brad Garrett's. That's right. Oh, hey, and we're available on YouTube now. Yeah. I'm putting the back catalog on there. I mean, nobody really listens to YouTube podcasts, but some people do. So I thought, whatever. So it's got a little waveform, a little fun design thing that yeah. I put on there. So check it out if you use YouTube and want to listen to a podcast. Go to bootuinc.com. Also, that's bootuinc.com. We've started updating the website with little capsules uh, describing what goes on in each of our podcasts, and we'll be a little more active there as well. We're, we're diversifying. Look, we can't be on the uh, really gross social medias as much, but we can do other things. I do think, and this is me speaking out loud on a podcast that I have not thought about talking about this before, I'm going to change my old Twitter account to the Boo2 Inc. account. So I bet, if you're listening to this, this will be a good motivation for me to do this. Now that you've said it. At Boo2 Inc. There's probably a, a Twitter account there that I'll just share the episodes and probably not going to talk because people yeah. suck on Twitter. But if you're on there, have at it. It'll be a vessel to get people to listen to us. Oh, and, and we didn't keep this going through the Brady Bunch, I don't think. I think it was mainly a Power Rangers thing. But if you or anyone you know has a son or a pet named Brad Garrett, you are obligated to give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or anywhere. Or if any of you out there are listening are stuck in a marriage that you just loathe the other person with every fiber of your being, leave us a five-star rate and review on Apple Podcasts. We're going to get millions of reviews, am I right? <laughs> That's a joke this, that everybody loves Raymond would make. Married people don't like each other. <laughs> Which reminds me, as we get out of here, it occurred to me that Everybody Loves Raymond doesn't even have a theme song that's appropriate. It's just a tinkly piano. It sounds, again, like a dinner party for Frasier and Niles. So... I took it upon myself to make one that fits better. Let's meet our hero, Raymond. An infantile man with no time for his family. Then there's his wife, Deborah. Beleaguered from the years of raising three kids alone. Next up is Ray's brother Robert, a depressed and jealous gentle giant cop. Frank and Marie, they're his parents. Their love was dead before it ever could get off the